Our guest in this segment is the Senate Finance Chairman, Eric Tarr. Senator Tarr, good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. I was uh, impressed by the work that was done recently in regards to the state income tax cut and that there was a compromise, basically, as I understand it, that has been agreed to. The governor had wanted an additional 5%. We spoke with you about that, and that sounded like, in terms of the numbers and making it work, that was a non-starter. But it looks like uh, the 2% number is what we're uh, going to settle on in addition to the 4%. Are you happy with that 2% number, Senator Tarr? I am. I am. You know, and when we talked last time, too, you know, that's uh, made it clear that, you know, I want to cut taxes as well, that the Republican Senate caucus wants to cut taxes and parents that legislature does, too. So we wanted to do it. We just wanted to do it responsibly. And so when, when the governor made the call and said we're going to do a 5 percent tax cut, it was without any kind of conversations with the legislature and without any kind of plan, knowing that we had a trigger that was kicking in already for an $88 million dollar decrease in taxes, uh, along with the phase out of the personal income tax on Social Security, which was another $38 million. And then you had also the sugar drink tax coming off, which is another $14 million. So we already had north of $100 million in taxes coming off. And um, and that trigger that we have on the personal income tax is pretty aggressive. You know, it, it pushes it pushes us down as, as far as we can go relative to the economic growth we have. And because of that trigger, the only other way you really have to reduce taxes is, is once that trigger kicks in, is you got to go and reduce spending, which I also like. I like reducing spending. So, but on a call, on a call, the governor sets the plan. You know, it's not like we can't go introduce bills. So when you do a a special session and the governor comes out and says he's going to do a five percent cut, but doesn't give you a plan on how to do it, knowing that that's the situation you're in, then then you got to really take a step back and say, okay, well, show us your plan. Well, it took a while for him to actually get that plan to us. Uh, But I'll tell you that uh, once those conversations started going, um, the staff he was sending down there worked really well with us to go through and and the the spending reductions that they brought back to me are the the same places I would go look at. But, you know, this was uh, made it clear that this was his show. I wasn't going to do his homework for him. And so, but they came back and they came with a plan that uh, I think is responsible. Where will the spending cuts take place, Senator Tarr? So one of the things is a is a bond that's coming off. There's um, um, the state you know, has loans that we go out that comes in on revenues that might come in on fees or dues or things like that um, off our special revenue. And they went in and identified a bond that's coming off here in uh, in a few years. We came off. We were paying nineteen or are paying nineteen million dollars a year on that bond, and they could go in and accelerate the payoff on that, kind of like if you snowballed your own debt. And so that knocked out $19 million of the 44 to $46 million-ish that would be required in order to do a 2%. Um, because we were coming down, and you know we, we hadn't really landed on the exact percentage of reduction yet until they would bring back what kind of spending they could reduce. So that was part of it. So that, that got us almost to 1% when they did that. So then they came back and started looking into areas of state government where efficiency should be found, that they're willing to come back and have their secretaries come back and give that to um, Governor, likely Governor Morsi when he comes in, as a recommendation for where to start on some of those agencies and the efficiencies they're working on. And that that's usually a spot that I'll go after as well, but from the finance chair uh, seat, it's always really difficult to get that information in an open-handed manner from the agencies because if you go in and you tell an agency hey we're um, we're going to reduce your your budget by 10 percent and i need you to help me find those spots well what they find are the things that are most politically difficult they're you know they're going to go in and if it's department of homeland security or department of homeland security or something like that you know it's going to be your you know well we're going to have a few more less police dogs we're not going to be able to do a bulletproof vest if it's uh department of human services it's going to be well uh, we're not going to have cps workers so child children are going to hurt and they're going to be placed in harm's way so you never get to the efficiencies which we know exist so what the governor's office came back with is that they're going to, that they are going to go to those secretaries to identify by those things for us so those protections as this transition is happening um, of protecting agency budgets from the executive side is kind of lifted a bit and allows us to get to some of the more um, the places we would like to go in and reduce spending, which is where you're administratively heavy. And those can be found. I mean, you know, for instance, the Department of Human Services had a $220 million surplus this year. Um, they had told us they were going to have a $140 million shortfall. So they were $360 million ahead 
of where they told us they were going to be. So there's there's efficiencies to be found. And so there we got a lot of cooperation in, in getting to those efficiencies enough so that it gave me confidence that we could get to a 2% and know that we wouldn't be upside down in 2026. In addition, uh, the leader, uh, a, a householder from the uh, House of Delegates, told us yesterday that there will now be an 18-month delay between the agreement of what the income tax cuts will be in the future and the implementation of those cuts. Yeah, I'd say one one of the things we had is, is I'm going to call an oversight um, between pretty much everybody that got a chance to look at the legislation on the first bill that we passed that would phase out the personal income tax over time. And that trigger is really determined at the rate of it in October. You know, our, our regular session usually is going to end in February or March or April, rather. And so you finish a session budgeting for your next fiscal year not knowing what that trigger is going to be. And that's kind of how it, it was passed. And the reason that's what it was that way is because the fiscal year ends on uh, June 30th, but your calendar year for taxes begins on January 1. So you've got a six-month offset there. So when we set that trigger, we were having to budget for the next fiscal year, not knowing what the revenue forecast could be for not knowing what the trigger would be. So what this allowed us to do, um, we pushed the trigger out um, – so that really the second January following the the rate reduction is when it would kick in so that when you go into budget for your next fiscal year, you know what that income tax rate is going to be so you can forecast your revenue. And that's really how we ended up in this special session so late. You know, we handed, handled about, um, about $500 million of surplus that normally would have been handled at the end of the regular session in the back of the budget, the surplus section of the budget. But we couldn't do that because we didn't know what the trigger was going to be, and we didn't know what the callback was going to be, and those type of things. So um, this gives us more certainty on state budgeting, but still allows the, the phase down of the personal income tax. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Senator. Uh, you mentioned morning. You mentioned agency cuts. So at this point in time, we do not have any positivity about what those cuts would be. Is that correct? Yeah, there's no – it's the areas of them, but not the specific lines. I would agree with that. So the areas and, – and, and what it really equates to is about – they need to get to about four-tenths of 1% reduction in spending across their agencies. But $19 million well, of the 46 is accounted for yeah. from the bond interest. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, that's from bond payment. Yeah. The other big news coming out of the last day or so was child care, and that's been passed and sent to the uh, to the governor. Uh Exactly what's in that bill, please, Senator? The, the child care is a child care tax credit that is a little over $4 million a year that makes it available. What that does is if, if you uh, owe taxes to the federal government uh, or to the state and you're going in and claiming a child tax credit um, with the federal government and you now so if you also owe taxes to the, the state and you, you can use that same child care tax credit up to 50 percent of what the federal allowable is um and so that's a it's a ref, what they call a refundable tax credit that means if you owe taxes you can get a credit against those taxes for what you paid in child care up to 50 percent of the federal allowable credit um that's and that's that's about little i think it's about 4.2 million a year is what the estimate would be on it those folks that do not pay tax uh, on the very low end of the economic scale are also ones that are probably greatest need for child care. Uh, what protection do these folks have? They're, they're already subsidized for child care. And, and that's, um, they're subsidized at a fairly strong level as well. That, that child care is made available to them um, through payment of the Department of Human Services. The... Um, Back when COVID hit and all these different rules came down from the feds in order to preserve um, certain types of businesses and entities and those type of things, so what they did for child care providers is that they changed the way they're paid from attendance-based to enrollment-based. So uh, if, you, if you had a kid you're taking to daycare and they go on Monday um, before COVID, before that rule came down, the DHS, Department of Human Services, is only going to pay that provider for them being there that Monday. They're not paying them for the whole week. So the federal government changed that from attendance-based to enrollment-based. Now, they may not show up all week, but they're still getting paid if they're enrolled in that daycare for the whole week. So 
That was one change. The other change that the federal government did is they took the means test off. The means test is an income test. You know, if you're at a certain earning level, you would qualify for that entitlement. Well, what they did is they took that that means test off there, and whether you were making thirty thousand a year or whether you were making two hundred thousand a year, you qualified for that entitlement. Um, as and that was done with ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act. When the the American Rescue Plan Act monies uh, fizzled out, dried up, then the federal government said, okay, states, to participate in Medicaid, you also have to do enrollment-based, but you're doing it on your own. We don't have a federal backup on it that that we just created. Now, that that federal backup was an increase in spending in child care of $60 million a year for four years. So over the past four years, spending went up nearly a quarter billion dollars a year in child care in West Virginia. That money went away. And so when that went away, what, what the Department of Human Services started doing, because they still have to do enrollment, is they started using their temporary assistance for needy families called TANF funds to pay for those, but then apply the means test back to it. So now you, you have to qualify for uh, Medicaid before you're going to be able to qualify for that entitlement, which means if you're qualifying for Medicaid, you're probably not paying taxes and your child care is covered. Maria. So um, at changing gears a little bit, Senator, what does 2% to the average West Virginia, West Virginian, um, what will that mean? What will it look like in terms of, of real money uh, dollars there? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I think it's about if uh, so median household income in 23 was about 60000 a little over 60000 a year. Um, and so if you take that median household income, um, that 2%, um, believe is around 80 to $85 on the year is what it would be. So, and then the 4% that's coming out already untriggered, you can, uh, you can just about double that. So, um, you're up at around 170 ish, $173, $175 somewhere a year that comes off of your income tax on an annual basis with that total of a 6% reduction. Um, if you're, you're if you're not qualifying for Social Security, if, you're, if it's you know, if you're a Social Security recipient, it's much more aggressive than that because it's it's phasing down entirely over the next couple of years. Gotcha. And at some point, I mean, obviously, we started at five, went down to two. At some point, um, do you foresee uh, this uh, continuing the continued decline of the personal income tax? I do. I don't. I don't anticipate a trigger hitting this year. Um, and if it did, you know, we pushed the trigger out. So it's it's going to be a couple of Januarys away if it kicks in this another trigger kicks in this October. And the reason I, I don't anticipate a trigger hitting this year is that I mean, a lot of the economic indicators that we use right now to see where we're going to be, they they don't indicate that that the economy in West Virginia this year is going to grow faster than the rate of inflation. Um. And we've reduced our revenue quite a bit, you know, because with this additional triggers came in on top of the 21 and a quarter percent that, that pre- preceded this one, we're north of 27 percent reduction in our personal income tax, um, which is about 40 percent of our revenue. So if this trigger doesn't kick in this year, um, then the only way that you would get an additional reduction in income tax coming out of this next session is that, or in, a, or in a subsequent special session, is the legislature will come in again and vote to reduce taxes again um, on top of whatever triggers are, have already been in place. And I'll tell you that um, I really like the way we set this up. Um, I, I call it the beauty of the trigger, and if you're, if you're a numbers nerd like I am, there's, there's some beauty in some of the ways that you uh, do these formulas. And the trigger that's there, if, if our economy grows at a rate faster than inflation, that that excess of growth or blessing of growth is returned to the taxpayers of West Virginia instead of being spent by the government. That's what the trigger is. And so for having done that, it suppresses the rate of great, the rate of growth of government spending. Because if that revenue is not coming into state coffers, then you have to budget according to a decreased revenue. Now, it still allows for inflationary growth because you have to exceed the rate of inflation in order to receive that. So what, what that tells a legislature, what it tells a governor, 
is grow this economy and grow it fast so you can reduce taxes. And then, so if, if you don't get there, but you still want to reduce taxes, and we all do, then what you're going to have to do is you've got to go in and find a way, find more efficiencies and reduce spending where there's waste, fraud, abuse, uh, areas that happen. And, and in, when you're running $20 billion of state and federal money through a state and year, it's there somewhere. You go find that. You reduce it, and that gives you opportunity to reduce taxes. So, you know, those are I like those pressures on the legislature. And in regards to what the dollar amount might be with the additional 2%, you might be listening to this and saying, oh, great, I got another $80. It's, it's not that. It's the incremental way of eventually getting to zero. And every 2% that you have cut is two less percent that you have to cut later because you're working your way towards zero percent. And this is the way to do it responsibly as you can afford to do it. It is, and, and, and this, this didn't happen by accident. Um, when we first started trying to figure out how to eliminate West Virginia's income tax, and we went through several iterations, and I've got uh, my chief counsel in, in the finance committee um, and chief of staff has written some sort of income tax elimination bill probably 30 times by this point for us, uh, trying to figure out how you get there. Now, in the process of that, you consult an awful lot of uh, think tanks out there that that have the research on what any other state has done or is planning to do or is in the process of doing. And so you get to go in and evaluate all those and how they compare to what West Virginia's opportunities are to do it. The only state that has ever successfully eliminated their income tax is Alaska. Every other state, the other eight states that have no income tax, it was in their constitution. They didn't have to go through a way to eliminate their income tax. So now there's been a plethora of other states, other legislatures come out and says we're, we're eliminating our income tax. And every one of them that has done that, that's not in the process now have done it, have failed. They went back at some point and had to raise taxes for what for the way they did it. So we went and looked at all those mistakes. You know, what, what happened that did not allow that legislature to follow through on the promises to their people of eliminating their income tax? And there's a lot of pitfalls. And so in order to try to avoid those pitfalls, what the legislature came to is we have to do this methodically over a period of years with triggers that are based on real numbers that we use for forecasting revenue. You, and you, we cannot base it on our severance tax yeah. because our severance tax is so volatile. So we take that piece out of it and we use those stable, predictable sources of revenue and know when we can reduce those to phase out our income tax. It's going to take it's going to take a while, but it, but this plan will do it. That's a wise course of action. You mentioned Alaska. Uh, they were able to reduce the income tax because of just that, the pipeline running from the North Shore down to uh, uh, providing oil and severance tax, if you will. And they're, they're having some pressure now. And there's some talk about Alaska going to have to reinstitute some other tax base in the future they do not have right now. So. Senator Tarr. Yeah, and that's, that's the volatility of a severance. Yeah. 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 Is, is there a formula that you folks are aware of that equates to uh, every extra dollar a West Virginian has in their pocket, how much of that gets returned to the state via a sales tax? Uh, because if I've got 10 more dollars to spend, I may go buy something that's subject to sales tax, and then you get a chunk of that back. Yeah, so if, if you are spending money in West Virginia with the dollar that you earn, yeah, there's a 6% sales tax um, on top of what you spend. And, and this is, you know, it's for, I don't like paying taxes. I'm sure anybody else does. I think it's, you know, it's a, a responsible contributing citizen pays taxes in order to support society, you know, that, to have a civilized society. So there's, there's a responsibility and the obligation to do that. However, it's a, also a responsibility and obligation of government to, to not abuse that. And so that's where, where we try to. So you know, the dollars you earned are taxed, and then you take the dollars that you earned that are already taxed, and you try and spend them, and they're taxed again. And there's taxes between all that. And so, um, so it does circulate. But what happens is, is if you, know, if you earn a dollar, and the state is take, going to go in and take a, you know, 5.2% of that, kind of, actually now I think it's going to be 4.93% of that. And then you also have the federal government who's going to take their probably 20-something to 30-something percent from it. 
So now you're down into 60 some cents you got left of your dollar. Um, and then, or excuse me, yeah, well, depending on if you're in the 30 some percent bracket. Yeah, and you're paying so Social Security tax, that, too. That yeah. 60 some cents left of your dollar. Now you're going to go buy something with it. And then we're going for whatever you bought with that dollar. Now we're going to take another 6% of sales tax that comes back into state government as well. So it does recirculate, but it's. Um, it's six percent of what you got left of your sixty cents. You know, if that, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So it's, so it really doesn't doesn't result in a large return that comes back into the state government and our sales tax collections, which to me is a voluntary tax. And if if I had if you know, if Senator Tarr had his way and was king for a day, and which is never going to happen, and that's probably there's a lot of people who are really glad of that. <laughs> um, that if I had my way, it would all be a consumption based tax economy. Mm-hmm. And the reason is that's a voluntary tax. You know, there's, there's certain things that we all have to live with, and, and you're going to pay taxes on those necessities of life. But beyond those necessities, and, and if you can only afford the necessities of life, we already use a tax base to pay for those necessities of life for you. So as taxpayers, uh, those we, we pay our taxes and we take care of those people. But if you are buying things beyond the necessities of life, that's a voluntary. You're deciding to do that. That's your choice, and then you're taxed on that. So that's a voluntary tax. Well, in West Virginia, twenty um, percent of those taxes on the consumption tax are paid for people who do not live in West Virginia. We have probably north of forty million people a year that travel through West Virginia. When we have one point eight million people here, they stop and they buy things. And that helps. They pay sales taxes. Hey, on that note, Senator, we are out of time. I appreciate yours. Well, thank you for having me on. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, thank Senator. you. Y'all have a great day. You too, okay. yeah. Senator Eric Tarr. He's the Senate Finance Chairman.